Good morning, everyone. We're glad to have everyone here this morning. I'd like to welcome our guests. We're so happy everyone's here. Uh, we still have a few that are um, struggling with uh, cancer and some other health, health issues, and there's a full list in the bulletin, so I want to pick that up so we can remember those folks in our prayers. But we're going to mention a few here this morning. L Lenny Riley will find out on October 8th the results of her procedure. Please pray for her recovery and good results. <clears throat> Miss Dorothy Jones' sister passed away this week. We need to pl uh, pray for that family, for their comfort. The ladies' class is meeting on Monday mornings at 10 a.m. in the church office. And don't forget about our area-wide singing October the 13th at 5 p.m. here at Grace Point. Uh, Jackson Farms, uh, we'll be taking the youth to Jackson Farms. That's on October 19th. The van leaves at 9 a.m. We have our trunk or treat coming up on October 22nd excuse me, 26th, from 6 to 8 p.m. We will be serving chili and hot dogs. A sign-up list has been placed in the foyer for food candy, food and candy. And if you're, you will be decorating a trunk. A bin for candy has been placed in the foyer if you just want to donate candy. There will be a ladies' young adult fall night on, on November 1st at 5.30 p.m. bringing your favorite fall dish a sign-up sheet has been placed in the foyer for that. <clears throat> a Wednesday night meal, this next Wednesday night meal will be mac and cheese, and we need volunteers to make macaroni and cheese and desserts. Toppings are provided. Please let Mike or Jamie know on the Facebook post. And I have a thank you card here I'd like to read. <clears throat> Dear church family, Thank you so much for the meals that you brought to us. We enjoyed them so much. You helped us when we were in a struggle. Ron was trying to get back to running his company and I am still trying to recover. Your kind thoughts and prayers are helping me greatly. We love and appreciate each of you in Christian love, Ron and Carol. Those that are to serve this morning, our song leaders, Bobby Coburn, our opening prayers, Ron Marsh, Children's Time, Chase Allman, Scripture Reading, Donald Braden, Lord's Supper Prayer will be Steve Culp, and our closing prayer will be Daniel Rickman. Ron? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give thanks this morning for the opportunity that we have to fellowship with fellow Christians of like mind, to get together and sing praises to your name, most of all to bring glory and honor to your name. Be with each of us as we listen and partake of the word today. May we apply it in our lives daily, but most of all apply it to those who are lost around us. We ask a special prayer for Lenny Riley as she waits for the results of her test. May all go well and the results be positive. For Dorothy Jones and her family and the loss of a loved one, give them, give them peace as only they can. Heavenly Father, there's a lot of strife and turmoil in this world at this time, wars going on. Be with the innocent that are suffering. Hold them in your hand. May, the, may peace will return as quickly as possible. Be with each of us as we go through our daily lives. May this worship be pleasing and honor in your sight. In Christ's name, amen. Quick note. The Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't say a word about four-part harmony and perfect note. Put a smile on your face, put a song in your heart, and let's sing out. Bobby. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steep and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus 
saves, wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, till to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing the islands of the sea. Echo back the ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, children's time. All right, come on up, there I am. It's children's time. We got visitors. Our kids' children's time is when they get to come up. Sixth grade and under. We got a lot of kids here at Grace Point. We love making them the center of the attention. Set out a bucket. They put some money in it. We're going to put that towards the needs of kids in our area. Have a short little devotion and time of prayer with them. Y'all come on up. All right, need some volunteers after everybody gets settled. Pick on some I haven't picked on in a while. Might embarrass you if you come up front now. Let's see. You want to help me? Okay, you can come forward. And you can help me too. All right, we got two girls up here. They're going to help. Everybody likes mints, right? You all like these? Do you like one or do you like a bunch? A bunch. Everybody likes eating a bunch, right? Okay, Mackenzie's being rational. She said just one. All right, I've got a game. I'm going to see if you can play it. I'm going to let her go first, and then you can go second to see if you learn anything from the game, okay? Are you ready to play? Okay. Hold this mint. Now, the, I'm going to start giving you more, but if you drop any of them, you lose, okay? And you get nothing. Hold this one. Hold this one. Here you go. Hold this one. Here you go. Hold that. Oh, no! Okay, put them all back. Put them all back. Put them all back. Okay, would you like to play? All right, see if you learned anything. Here you go. Hold this man. Here you go. Hold that one. Hold that No! No! Oh, no. You lose. I am sorry. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Nothing for you. Would anyone else like to play? All right, come on up. You ladies can sit down. Thank you very much. Okay. Have you learned anything? He's already got a mint in his mouth. <laughs> Here's a mint. Would you like to hold it? If you drop any, you're done. Here, hold that. Here, hold that. Here, oh! All right. You said you learned. I don't know about that. That's questionable. Who's learned the lesson that wants to come up? I Do you want to come up? All right, let's see it. Here's a mint. You can hold this one. If you drop any, you're out. Are you ready? Hold this. Hold this. Hold this. No? Okay. All right. What's the idea? What's the problem? I'm cheating a little bit. <laughs> That's always true. M okay, Mackenzie, come up. Her answer earlier might give the game away. Would you like one mint or a bunch? <gasps> okay, you're free to hold on to that. Now, would you like to try and catch more or are you happy with the one? Okay, please sit down. You get your mint. <laughs> you got nothing. You got nothing. You got nothing. You got nothing. But she got the mint. How did she get the mint? She just got one. What, Ariane? <gasps> oh, 
she wasn't greedy. She just took one. Okay, now, trying to make this into a lesson. If I said, this is Jesus, and you can have him, but you have to hold on tight. And now there's going to be other things in your life. There's going to be school and family and games and fun, and you're going to want everything, but if you're greedy, you might drop the most important one. And if you lose Jesus, do you get anything? Yeah. No, because Jesus is the most important thing ever, most important person ever. So the lesson for you guys, and really the lesson for us grown-ups, with everything we've got, we have to focus on holding on to Jesus because he's a whole lot more important than a mint. Can you all remember that? Yeah. All right, let's close our hands, bow our heads, let's pray together. You guys repeat after me. Dear God, we love you. Please help us remember to focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all go sit down. Praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee. God, for thy spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us I spin in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Multiplied to me, there 
trembled at the law I'd spurned Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was multiplied to salvation's plan oh the grace that brought it down to man oh the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free Daniel has been leading the new song class, and the song today he was leading was Waymaker, or trying to get us to learn it. In the Bible, the term Waymaker refers to God's ability to create a path for his people to overcome and triumph. It can also refer to Jesus, who is considered a Waymaker, because he can create a way, and there seems to be no way. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful of this bread that represents Christ's body that was broken for us. Help us to reflect back on that sacrifice for each one of us as we partake of this emblem. In his name we pray. Amen. At this time, we'll offer a blessing for the cup. Father, we're thankful for this cup that represents the blood that was shed on the cross for us. And we know that through Jesus' blood, 
He is our way maker. For us to him we pray. Amen. this time we're given an opportunity to give back to the Lord in a monetary manner. But I think as we do this, let's reflect during this given week all the blessings we have, both spiritually and physically. They're simply innumerable. Uh, I could just mention a few. If you got up this morning, you turned the light switch, if you turned the water on, if you had food in the house, if you drove over here. There's a lot of people in the world who can't do this. You know, tremendous damage from the hurricane over in the southeast part of the U.S. It's just a, like a war zone. And then there's other places in the world that the poverty is unbelievable. So let, let's reflect on the shower of blessings God has given us, both physically and spiritually. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all the blessings you've given to us. Help us to realize that all blessings come from you. We know that you always try to do good for us and do the best for us. Help us to worship you and to love you and give back in a meaningful way how you prospered us this week. Through his name we pray. Amen.
convenient for you, would you please stand for this song before the lesson and remain standing for the scripture reading to follow. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come when I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done? Is that his voice I morning scripture reading will be taken from 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As far as you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of, of an evangelist, fulfill <coughs> ministry. Please be seated. Good morning, church. So good to be with you here today. I, I was told the Burgess's son at home picked up a book and said, good morning. <laughs> Mom and dad say good morning back. We got a future preacher on our hands here. Proud to hear that. Boy, I hope you're glad to be here today. Hope you're excited to worship God and the opportunity to do that with a bunch of Fellow believers here at Grace Point is such a blessing. I pray that you don't overlook that. A lot of good going on in the world today. Good day to be a Razorback fan. We don't have very many of them, okay? 
Got to celebrate the ones we got. I'm as casual a fan as you ever get, but I know when we upset Tennessee, we can all celebrate. Next week, our second Sunday night of every month singing is happening again. If you missed the first one, this go around, you missed a great event, so don't miss this next one. Next Sunday at 5 p.m., it's going to be a great night of worship. I'm so glad you're here today. I almost missed it. And then I looked down at the calendar today. You know, Jamie and I picked up this job October 8th of 2018. So it's six years in two days that we've been here. I don't know what kind of eldership hired a 24-year-old, <laughs> but I'm so glad they did because now this man can be in front of you today talking about the unchanging gospel. Our series that will conclude, Lord willing, next week has been the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. That's the most important part of our life. And we've been identifying throughout this series the fact that our main thing has to be Jesus. Of all of the things that demand our attention, there can only be one that we are fully devoted to, and that one can only be Jesus. He's the only one deserving of our attention. He's the only one deserving of our life. And we've spent so far six weeks, today's our seventh, focusing on that fact. So hopefully you've understood at this point, if Jesus is not your main thing, you need to change your life to make him the main thing in your life. And part of accepting Jesus is accepting his gospel message. There are some who call themselves believers today who would love to accept Jesus the nice, clean, polished image of this great, nice guy with a beard, but who would love to separate him from his gospel because they feel like they want his love, they want his grace and his mercy, but boy, death, burial, and resurrection just has some stickiness to it, has some problems to it, has some complications to it that I don't want to accept in my life, so I'd love to rip the two apart and just have the nice, good-feeling, warm, fuzzy Jesus. It's impossible to do that. So they've failed in their undertaking to separate Jesus from his gospel. In fact, if you are capable of separating Jesus from his gospel, you've made up a new Jesus. He's no longer Jesus. You cannot have Jesus without his gospel. And church, for us, that's great news. In the world we live in today, you can look out. How often and quickly do the standards of the world we live in change? They change day to day. You, know, you can't say that. You can't say that these days. You can't talk like that these days. You can't say that these days. Pretty soon, you can't believe that these days. As a Christian, young as I am, I've only ever been called to one standard. And as many more days as I'm given on this earth, I will only still be called to one standard. For us as Christians, we only have the gospel, and praise God, that will never change. The world may want it to. The world may want to soften it down and change just a few parts of it, take a few parts out and make some a little bit nicer. But for eternity, until Judgment Day, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection will always be the gospel and it will always be good news. So as I try to make Jesus my main thing, yes, I get the warm, fuzzy, love, gracious, nice, kind Jesus. But also with him, I choose to accept the story, the truth, the reality of his death, burial, and resurrection, and the implication that that brings upon my life, and the need for my own death, burial, and resurrection. So I, I pray that today you have chosen to follow and fulfill and to share the unchanging gospel. But if not, we can convince you more today. And if you have, I'll just give you an attaboy, pat on the back, and I can push you forward to keep you going. Let's look at a few components of this the one true gospel. Part of the unchanging gospel is that it is the true gospel. Capital T, capital H, capital E. This is it. Paul in Galatians would stand up strongly to defend exactly that. There was a, a funny video online I shared with Jamie 
a cartoon guy said, hey, a new letter from Paul, and he opened up the scroll, and a fist came out and punched him in the face. That was the church of Galatia. They had a lot of lessons to learn, and Paul was very stern in teaching those lessons. And, of course, the implication is, what would Paul's letter to us look like today? How firm would his letter to us be today? Well, unfortunately for Galatia, one mistake that they made of a few was that they were allowing foreign truths to come into their community and start corrupting the one true gospel to the point that some of them were substituting the one unchanging true gospel with another. And although they won't ever admit it, because gospel is a relatively Christian term, it belongs to us, every truth claim comes with its own gospel. One set of core beliefs that if you do not believe, you're no longer involved in that group of believers. All truth claims come with their own gospels. And if you are not careful, what you will be tempted to do, like Galatia was tempted to do and succumbed to that uh, temptation, is involve the true gospel with false gospels. As soon as you corrupt the one true gospel, it's no longer the one true gospel. You've lost it. And the more you allow the false with the true to intermingle, the more you will begin substituting the true for the false and only accept the false. That's exactly what the church in Galatia was doing, and Paul warned them sternly. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. I'm astonished. He just opens the letter. Hey, good to see you. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Wait, that's a mistake. Verse 7, not that there is another one. There's not even a different gospel. There's only one gospel. But there are some, church, who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. He says twice, so you guys get the point. If there's someone preaching a false gospel, they should be accursed. No, you guys don't even understand. If I even begin speaking a different gospel, or if an angel from heaven comes down in front of you and starts saying something contrary to the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, let that angel, or me, the great and mighty Paul, be accursed. There's only one true gospel. And Paul's warning, as we've seen and said, is still relevant today. There are a lot of people who aren't bold enough to say, I've got a new gospel, follow me, believe me. But they are bold enough to distort the one true gospel. Here's an easier gospel over here. Our church teaches the nice version of the Bible. We cut out that whole judgment part. No one likes that part. We've got coffee and lasers and smoke. And that's fine, we could have those things too. As long as we still maintain the one true gospel. Church can look like whatever it needs to look like as long as we're following the one true gospel. If you distort that, you've lost it all. And you deserve nothing but curses. That's what Paul says. Today there are so many, can't even begin to count them, so many alternative gospels, so many people who would love to distort the gospel, and Paul reminds us. There are no other Gospels. There is only one Gospel. And if Paul wrote a letter to your house, we'll make it personal, would he say to you, I'm surprised, I'm astonished, that you, who God loves, who, remember a year ago when God was there in your life, you worshipped him then, I'm astonished. You're abandoning him for a lie. You're doing away with the one true Gospel for a lie. Or would he say, dear brother, dear sister, I'm so proud of you. This gospel that I'm currently dying for, imprisoned for, that Jesus died for, 
you're following it. You've stayed faithful to it. What would he say to you? This is a personal question. Do you follow the one true gospel or have you either poisoned it with the influence of others or have you just abandoned it completely and substituted it for anything else? Paul's warning here is powerful as he shows us the danger of departing from the one true gospel is that it leads to spiritual deception but also a false sense of security. Yeah, I'm a good person. Yes, I have a gospel. Aren't good people who follow a gospel going to heaven? That's what most people would like to lead you to believe, but Paul says, no. There is only one way. There is only one path. There is only one door. There is only one gospel, and most of you don't have it. He says, at least in this letter, and might say to you, or me, you feel secure. I've got a truth claim. I've got a, a golden rule. I've got a sense of morality. It's my own. You've got your own, but yours is weird, so I'm not, I don't have to follow yours. I'm just going to follow mine, and God has to understand that I'm trying my best to be a good person. If it's anything else, it's not the one true gospel. And we as Christians, as followers of the one true gospel, who got to live it out for those of us who have been baptized, got to be killed spiritually, buried spiritually, and raised spiritually again. Our own gospel in our own life, we get to say, I'm not saved because I'm good enough. I'm not saved because my story and my truth is powerful enough, as much as I hate that phrase, my truth. I'm saved because I follow the one true gospel, and you can too. And by remaining anchored in the truth of the gospel, we can protect ourselves from being led astray. Hey, I, I really like this speaker. I really like this teacher. But I've got this standard here in my hands. I've got this word written on my heart. And this guy's saying a few things that are contrary to this standard, to this truth, to this gospel. So I wisely set aside this false teacher instead of the gospel. It's an open book test. You've got it for the rest of your life. That's the standard you set. The true gospel and anything else. Paul continues now, as we jump to a different writer. Paul also echoes this idea, but now we'll jump to a different writer. A brother of someone important. Jude chapter 1 will be there in a second. We've got to understand, that once we accept the one true gospel, we've got to do something about it. The gospel is not only something to be believed in, but it is also something to be defended. And if Jesus and his gospel is the main thing in my life, when someone says something contrary to that main thing to me, I should be proud enough to stand up and say, that's not right. That's not going to help you. I've got my own faith. I've got my own gospel. I've got the truth. You're welcome to follow it as well. But I'm not, I'm not going to allow you to muddy the waters. I'm not going to allow you to lead innocent people away after your false gospel. I'm going to stand up for the truth. And we see less and less of that today. I won't say we see none of it. I'll certainly say I see some of that in you. But I think we can all agree we see it a little less. Jude chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, Jude says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, the same gospel, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. That's how it happens. The author of Jude understood it. Jude himself, he knew it. You don't choose immediately one day to deny Jesus and go after a false god, unless you're hurt in some major way, and you attribute and put that blame on Christ, 99% of people won't immediately say, I'm a believer, not today. But falseness, deceivers, 
can creep in into your life, into your home, into your family, and they can poison you from the inside out. If you don't immediately have the wisdom, we can start at the very beginning, have the wisdom to see the poison coming in, then have the clarity of thought to say, we've got to do some performative surgery here. We've got to make some cuts. We've got to make some changes. I have diagnosed the fact that the poison has come into me or my family. I'm willing to sacrifice the corrupted part of me and get rid of it and then actually do it. Contending for the faith actually starts in your own home. Do you defend your home? Do you make sure your home, yourself, your family, has the one true gospel? Or is your family slowly being corrupted and you're sitting on the sidelines allowing it to happen? There's only one option. You're either standing for the truth or you're being corrupted. Paul, or Jude here, rather, would have you contend for the faith, would have you stand up and not allow these false truths to come into your life. Contending for the faith, saying yes, Jesus is my main thing. He is my Lord and Savior. Means not allowing others first for you personally to corrupt the truth, but secondly for others to corrupt them and lead them away from the truth as much as it is up to you as long as you are able to try to save others. You should. They have to accept Jesus on their own terms. They have to work out their own faith. But are you allowing a good, wise leader, perhaps yourself, to lead others to the truth, or are you sitting idly by allowing false leaders to lead them to lies and deception? Contending for the faith also is not just about defending against external threats. It's also about guarding our own hearts and minds. And this, I would say, is what contending for the faith is. Yes, I would love all of you to be on a street corner today, skipping lunch, to preach the good news to Jonesboro. But before you do that for a second, and who's crazy enough to do that? Don't allow Satan to deceive your heart. If you can do that, I'll never ask you to do anything else. If you can keep the truth in your heart and never allow Satan to deceive you, you'll live faithfully for the rest of your life. You'll do everything the church needs you to do. But as soon as you let deception creep in, as soon as you allow corruption to creep in, you've, be- you've got to make the changes to go back to that sense of purity that the gospel and Jesus can offer you. And then you've got to live it out. Living out the gospel is contending for the faith. It is understanding that only one gospel it is true, and it is making Jesus the main thing in your life. If you accept Jesus, you accept his gospel. We already stated that you get to live out this gospel in your own life. You also are called to be buried, to rise again in newness of life, and then to walk in that newness of life. If you don't live faithfully, the gospel has no valuable, uh, value to you. It isn't valuable to you. You've rejected it. Because the gospel demands that you live it out. And if you don't, you've not accepted the demands of the gospel. Look at our scripture reading again. As Paul now, Paul again writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, first five verses. Here's Paul's charge to a man he dearly loves. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his kingdom appearing, and uh, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, share the gospel, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. We talked about in our series on Timothy how I dislike those last two words. With patience and teaching, we've got to do it. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, Timothy and Christian today, Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Live out the gospel. That's what Timothy needed to do if he was going to have a chance as a young minister. That's what you need to do first if you are going to have any chance. And secondly, if our church is going to survive, we need its Christians and its believers to live out the gospel. We know what the rest are going to do. Paul said it way back then to Timothy. He could say it again about our nation today. 
people are going to try and please themselves. And they're going to find people who will tell them pleasing things to their ears. If your church tr tr teaches hard truths, some are going to abandon that truth and accept the nice fluffy stuff. I I've said it a few times, don't mistake me. Being a Christian is fluffy. Being a Christian is nice. It's the best thing there is. It's the best life imaginable now and ultimately eternally. But truth is hard sometimes. And there will be some who are too cowardly to accept it, who abandon it. That's what Paul warns Timothy about. But as for you, Timothy, let others do what they will. But as for you, Christian, understand the gospel enough to be prepared when everyone asks you, what do you believe? In season, out of season. When you're in the mood to share the gospel, when you're not in the mood to share the gospel. Do you have it in your mind? Do you have it in your life in such a way that you can share it? Maybe that's step one for you. Learn the gospel, accept the gospel, and then you can share it. Allow others to pursue whatever they will pursue. But as for you, encourage, exhort, teach, have patience, have love. Share the truth with others. And what the world loves to find in the church more than anything else is a hypocritical Christian. They will tear you apart if they see a speck in your eye. So acknowledging our own sin, acknowledging Jesus is my salvation, not myself, he is the truth, not me, we can then go forward living out the gospel to the best of our ability, knowing that he continually cleanses us. And then when someone approaches us and challenges us and says, well, you're hypocritical, you're not perfect, we can say, I'm not perfect, but I've been perfected. It's because of the true gospel that I'm living out imperfectly that I can confidently say that I am saved. And only by the mere fact that I know you don't have the true gospel do I dare to say that you need to change. I won't condemn you. I can't do that. That's only the Lord's to do. But I can say you need to come to Jesus. I'm in fact commanded to do so. And then our lives should be such that we live out an example of the gospel, that our lives are the gospel. And if we do that in a world that rejects biblical truth, it tempts us to compromise our truth or to shy away from the truth. Paul reminds us the responsibility that we have is not to please people, but to remain faithful to the truth of God's word. Who do I aim to please? Man, you know how differently I'd be living, Paul says, if I just wanted to please men. You know how powerful I could be, Galatia, if I just wanted to please men. I'm here to please God. So now Paul encourages Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And in his letter here, don't get him mistaken, Paul is not saying, hey, Timothy, you're the only one. Only you have to evangelize. Paul reminds the readers that more than just the responsibility of the elders and of your preacher, the responsibility to defend the gospel is for all believers. That includes you. You're all. You're everyone. You're someone. What do you do? The gospel of Jesus Christ is unchanging. That's the standard for eternity that you're going to be called to. His death, burial, and resurrection is the only thing that matters. Have you accepted it in your life? Are you telling others about it? Are you defending it? Are you living that truth out in your life? Or... Have you been slowly deceived and corrupted? If today you know there's a little bit of poison in your life, you have the opportunity before God as you do every day to make it right by sacrificing that poisoned part of yourself and accepting his truth yet again. And if that's been publicly wrong, you can do that in front of the church and we can pray for you and we can carry you through your journey of faith. But if you've never begun your journey of faith. If you've never accepted the gospel and you need to be baptized today, if there's anything we can do for you to help you, please come as we stand and sing. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of
There's a call come ringing o'er the restless waves in the light, in the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, in the light, in the light, in the light, the blessed gospel. Dear God, thank you for letting us come here this morning to have a time of worship for you. Dear God, please help us in our lives to look for ways that we can spread your word and help us to build up others in our lives to be better Christian servants for you. Dear God, please forgive us when we fail you and help us to turn away from those sins that we commit. Dear God, please be with those who are sick and help them to be restored to their health if it be your will. Dear God, thank you most of all for sending your son to die on the cross that we have a means to be forgiven of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.